Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Battalion Chief Mark Davis here. Welcome to Episode 2, Season 2 of Challenges in the Street. Uh, today we're excited to uh, bring some discussion about the float officer position. The title of today's program is Keeping a Float as a Float Officer. Before we uh, move to that, I want to uh, just cover a couple things. Lorraine Avenue, right? So we had a lot of views on the last episode of Lorraine Avenue on the Bostock. We promised you some follow-up on that. We're still trying to figure out what that follow-up is going to look out, look like, so you're just going to have to be patient there. Uh, but a lot of good stuff, a lot of good views on Lorraine Avenue. We do have a couple other boss talks in the works, right? There's been a number of uh, significant incidents here in the last few weeks, so you'll probably see another episode coming out just having fine-tuned that uh, as of now. As we've done it a couple times before, I want to look at a couple photos from incidents. Uh, let's pop up the uh, engine 731, I believe. So somebody was able to catch a hydrant picture. I know we've had a bunch of discussion over, uh, probably since we got the Pierce engines, right? And I realize this isn't a Pierce. But since we got the Pierce engines, we had the videos uh, talking about uh, taking your own hydrant and those kind of things. So good setup here, right? Two supply lines coming in, using the rear, using the side intake. Uh, just wanted to catch that. We try to show some different pictures of people doing stuff. So that was a first due fire, I believe, in 31's area, and they had a hydrant across the street, and that was their hookup. Notice no humid valve, right? So we've had discussion back and forth using, not using the humid valve. In this particular case, not used, and uh, they had their own hydrant. So good job there. Let's flip to the ladder picture. So actually, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a bunch of ladder photos. So this is some ground ladder work at the, I want to say, second alarm on Duval, maybe. I don't remember exactly. It's Company 8's area. They've had a couple, a number of fires up there. A couple points to note, right? Garden apartments, or what we're calling garden-style apartments, uh, you can never have enough ground ladders. Ground ladders to multiple levels. This photo was taken later in the incident, so they may have been moved a little bit. Ground ladders are for us, ground ladders are for the occupants. And the thing to point out, which actually uh, Battalion Chief Blake pointed out, right, is you look at it and say, wow, that's, that's a lot of ladders. Yeah, it will take a lot of people to throw those ladders. And in general, unless you're coming out of eight or have uh, some additional LFRD staff and you're running a special with three people, so you got to think about what am I doing to get those ladders up with three people? Where am I getting help on that? And in some cases, that may be part of that rapid intervention group, right? Somebody, hey, can you help me come around back and throw a couple ladders? Anyway, wanted to point that out. There's been some other good ladder work in the last, uh, last month or so with a number of fires that we have. So anyway, kudos on both of those. I uh, don't know who took the photos. Uh, give you credit. I just don't know who did it. They just sent them to me. All right, so on that, uh, we want to move to the float officer discuss, uh, discussion about that. We have three float lieutenants. We'll introduce them here shortly. From the battalion chief perspective, right, so the float officer is a very important position. That is a person that moves around generally within a battalion, sometimes in a couple battalions, depending upon their seniority. That position is critical because there's a very good chance that they are the company officer for the day. And while we may joke about it, hey, substitute teacher, da-da-da-da, whatever, right, they really are a critical function, and we really want to try to support those folks. They generally are our least senior officers. They get put into the float pool. Uh, some folks enjoy that. They get to see a lot. Other folks, it can be stressful at times, depending upon uh, where your assignment is, because all five battalions are different, as all three shifts are different. We try to do everything the same. We have policies to do that, right, procedures to do that. But at the end of the day, we all know that there are differences, differences in response areas, difference in how we staff the stations, difference in apparatus that we ride. So today, that's today's topic, and I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Captain Brady Miller, who's going to introduce our float lieutenants that we brought in today and get the show rolling. Captain Miller. Chief Davis, uh, thank you very much. Again, we are live here from the training school, and we have uh, three float lieutenants. Off to my far right, Lieutenant Escalero, Battalion 1 on the C shift. Next to him, uh, Lieutenant King, uh, Battalion 3 on the A shift. And to my left, we have uh, Lieutenant Richardson, who uh, works at Battalion 3 on the A shift. Um, so, uh, uh, 
really, we, we chose these three guys for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of the big reasons was different perspectives, meaning uh, Lieutenant Escalero, longtime float guy, uh, Lieutenant Richardson, a couple of years, and Lieutenant King, less than a year. So their perspectives uh, might be different and how they do things, quite frankly, might be different. Um, and we're going to talk about that, what makes them successful um, and how they deal with issues that arise on a daily basis. So I'm just going to start right in and we're going to go to Lieutenant Escalero and talk about your approach to lineup. <clears throat> What's your approach to the lineup table? Yeah, so um, I'll give credit where credit's due. Uh, uh, Kevin Nessis, so, who's recently retired, um, gave me the pointer of creating some type of structure. So um, being, being the millennial that I am, I made it into a PDF file. And basically, I'm able to insert into my lineup um, important folks, including like the EMS duty officer, the doc chief, the players around me, uh, what the weather looks like. And in that structure, um, depending if there's a, a, a master or a senior fireman, I, I lean on them to create the lineup. But if I have to make the decision, I'll step up. And obviously, in that same file, you know, I have other certain items like overtime, sick, sick notes, a, some type of topic that we'll discuss in a practical evolution in the, in the midday. So that's usually how lineup is discussed, and we all take part of it, part in it, in the, uh, at the lineup table. So, do you have a round table after your lineup? Do you go around the table? And I have been to firehouses that do that. Yeah, um, and it seems to be very successful. I have a hard time incorporating it into my lineup. I would love to do it. Um, do you do something like that? Yeah, um, one hundred percent. I, uh, if someone's got something to add to the, for the good of the company. I would like to hear it, whether you are, you know, a 20-year veteran or just starting off. I've been surprised by folks that have just started or just left probation, and, you know, you never know that they were either engineers or they volunteered somewhere, and they have the two cents to add into. So give everyone the opportunity to add. Oh, good. Yeah. So is it more of a casual structured in the beginning turns casual? or? Um, yeah, it's usually structured, casual, but always throw something in that um, brings it all back. You know, allow folks to be who they are, but allow us to also work as a team to focus an item. So an example, you know, recently we've all gone through COVID, so we can talk about that or we can talk about, um, you know, f the fires that have been happening, these significant uh, incidents that have been happening in the county. So, hey, B-Shift ran this. Let's listen to it or let's talk about it. What do you think? What did you hear? So on and so forth. Okay. Dre, how do you approach writing assignments? Um, writing assignments are usually approached if I've been to the station before or if I've worked with um, that group of people, it's easier. But a lot of times I land on the master to handle that. So, of course, if I'm riding, a, riding a, the seat of an engine, I know I have my master firefighter who's going to be my driver. I know I have my paramedic that I have to have riding forth. So if um, I'm speaking to the master, I'm asking, you know, when was the last time the person who's riding third was on the EMS unit? How often are they riding? How reliable are they? Um, I'll find it, you know, in the beginning of the shift that you have to be able to communicate with that person sitting to your left. If you don't make communication with that driver, then everything goes south really fast. They can go south really fast. So um, after speaking with the master and, you know, uh, getting the person who's going to be riding behind me, my next conversation is having a conversation with that person. Uh, we're speaking about different lines, uh, lines that I like pulled, depending on what... Are you doing this before your lineup or you have lineup and we're checking fire trucks and this now is, you're talking this to is the lineman? This usually done before lineup. Okay. Because there are a lot of times that, you know, we're getting to the station and we're relieving the shift before us at 5.30 or 6 a.m. Well, in that time, a box goes out. That can be the worst. In some cases, those are the worst boxes that go out because you have a lot of people scrambling around. 
So I like to get that done as soon as possible. Even if I'm speaking to the person from the shift before, if the mob line person isn't there, or the master of the shift before, if that per if they're awake, yes, I want to communicate with them just so that we're on the same page. Do you do that with the person riding the ambulance as well? The person, right? Yes. Well, that's usually done at lineup. So if we, I have personnel riding the ambulance. I want to make sure that they know the area. I want to also make sure that if it is too detailed people, and sometimes that happens that we have too detailed people in the ambulance, that if they are in trouble, call for help early. Whether they're calling for help from communications or they're calling back to the station, call for help early. Also, if they get on scene and they have a patient that may be um, just too much for them to handle, Again, call for help early. I don't care if it's 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. It's my job to go out there and help them because I'd rather help them than they you know, have some type of get in trouble or there's an injury. It's easier for me to help them than to you know, go down the road of an injury or you know, just a call going south. Joe, being a relatively new lieutenant, how do you, do you do anything different? Have you sorted out how your lineup is going to go, those interactions with the drivers or your writing assignments? Uh, my lineup is basically the same uh, kind of deal as ESCO's. I kind of you know lay out who the, uh, who the chiefs are for the day, who the EMS duty officers, especially now with Blue Alert, who um, is running that EMS 700 spot, the split shift, because that can kind of, you know, people in the field have kind of, you know, figured out who's who and how to, like, approach each of those people. So I think that's important. Um, and then I just kind of present the uh, information of what needs to get done for the day. Um, and then I typically go around the table, you know, start with the master um, or more than one master and then go down the table, make sure, you know, if anybody has anything good for the good of the company, then that's their time to go over it. As far as lineups, I, um, I haven't, I've yet to be in a position where I have to really do anything or insert myself into the writing assignment position. I typically allow the master or whoever the senior guy is working that day to kind of dictate um, who's riding where. They, you know, they kind of, every place is different, but they all kind of seem to have their own rotation going. So I kind of just let it go um, until I see that there's an issue and then, you know, I would step up. But I have yet to run into an issue. Um, and like Dre, I always make sure that if it's two detailed people on AML instead, you know, one of them is you know from the battalion or somewhat no good with the area like i have a conversation with the ambulance crew and make sure that they're comfortable doing it and at that point if they're not then i would have to you know figure out you know changing running some to that spot but typically i just kind of let the the master run the show you know they it seems like they do that with the normal officer that they work for so i just kind of let them continue to do it so we know um thank you so we know that map books throughout the county vary from place to place and in, in Quantity, detail, everything. How do you deal with the map book situation? <clears throat> um, so the first thing I do when I get to a new firehouse that I've never worked at is I go through every binder uh, that's in the engine or tower or whatever I'm riding. Um, and I try to find three streets in each map book, make sure I can navigate um, the street view, the box maps, make sure I can find it on a map. Um, and that's typically that then dictates what I do on the first call in that area. So if I know that I'm running, you know, Station 11's area from Station 6, I'm not up to date with their maps or comfortable with it, then I'm then going to use the MDC or use some sort of like, you know, Active 911 or Google Maps and get me to the scene. And then from there, I'm usually utilizing the uh, CAD mapping software to find hydrants. And, you know, once I get close enough to that block, then that's when I'm kind of switching over to the county stuff, but also like verifying where Active 9-1 is taking you is matching where the CAD is showing it as on the map system also. And I would argue one of the biggest stressors as an officer is that immediate time or that short time after we receive a call until we get to the scene. That is that is a, a, a huge stressor. So tell me what you do, Dre, as far as your combination of getting to an event. Do you use the paper maps? Do you use the the um, MDC, do you use your telephone? What do you do? Well, I'm using all three devices. I'm actually using the paper maps. I'm using my uh, Active 911 on my phone or the Zillow phone. And I'm also using the MDC. But more times out of, you know, more, more than, 
enough times the uh, driver actually knows the area that we're going to. So if I'm using the paper map books, um, uh, for an example, if I'm working at station 25, the master there, before we're making a left out that station, they're like, yeah, you want to look on map 25, page 2, uh, section B. And the apartment complex is right there, so it saves me a lot of time. And again, that just goes back to communicating with that driver. You have that communication with that driver, I just think everything is easier. A lot more comfortable. So do you, Esco, do you kind of do the same thing? Yeah, um, you know, I didn't have appreciation for map or learning your area until really when I hit, uh, sat in that front seat. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I was brought up to learn your area and to know your area, your first due, maybe some second due, or so on and so forth. But, you know, I thought it was more of a tedious task. And then now that I'm an officer, I'm like, wow, that takes a lot of off my shoulders because you know, depending where you are, and including what he was saying, his Hewitt Avenue, if I don't have to tell you lefts or rights every single intersection, I can go to the Hewitt Avenue map, and this, is, this map has driveways. So like driveway one, driveway two, driveway three. And then inside those complexes, you know, the condos aren't labeled like our standard. It'll be one, two, three, and it continues four, five, six, seven. So as I'm coaching, it's nice to say, hey, Hewitt Avenue, I've got it. Boom. Okay, I can go into the MDC, I'll hit locate map, boom, I, I got my hydrant once we hit the age, apron. I'm, I'm pushing some of the tasks way ahead before we get there and I can have the conversation with the folks in the back. Has and that ever come back to bite you? The, the locate map? No, 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 just the driver going, I'm good, I yeah. got you, and we, it has. we're using Hewitt oh, Avenue. Yeah, and there's Well, plenty. that's, Hewitt Avenue is, it's kind of one of those, like, kind of everyone knows that one, right? Okay. So, but there's, it has. It has got me, uh, has bit me in the past where I've got it and then we don't have it. So I, I have like kind of a fail safe where you use the, the clip, clip your, your, the map with the running route. And then so if they need to go, we need to go back and just go right back to where that running route is without having to flip through A through Z. <coughs> okay. So you're always looking a running route up no matter what. Marking that page and well, then depending kind of on the, working you, you through can, the next portion. Through the day, I mean, you know, I've been in certain battalions or certain folks, like I can trust certain, certain people, but if I, if I just met you, it's no, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not, it's not a, a, it's not a knock. It's not a knock initially. And then eventually that clip goes away. And it's just because I just want to make sure that as I represent your team as best as I can, because, you know, obviously I'm a guest and I want to make sure that whatever you guys are putting out there is a representative of your station and I'm not the weakest link. So that's the way I see it. Okay, good. Um, Joe, COVID uh, is, is certainly a hot button right now. Do you, are we continuing to talk about that or do you continue to talk about that at, at lineup? I might bring it up. I'm, I'm more of, like I bring it up, you know, make sure like no one's feeling ill, like that kind of deal, um, like we're supposed to. Um, and then I kind of just, you know, watch throughout the day and make sure everyone's doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and it's important to um, you know, keep up with that stuff. Are you finding variations of practices at different firehouses? Meaning just a, a, an EMS <clears throat> call and the PPE that we're initially wearing, are, are there variations? I don't feel, I feel like where I've gone, I've gone, so I go pretty much all over the place. And I feel like on most calls, that is typically the one thing that we are doing the same on different calls, different people, different units. Um, and I would agree with that. Yeah. That's nice to hear. <clears throat> I think it's definitely, you know, that's definitely something that we do good at that we're all doing across the board. I think the only area that it kind of gets in differences is like, you know, what you do with, you know, like a COVID positive person, you know, you show up with four people on edge, do you send everybody in? Do you send the medic and one person in? Do you divvy it up? Do you send the same two people every time? So, and is that part of the expectations that you would lay out at lineup? Um, we run an ALS call that <clears throat> I typically, E4 and A2 are going in or, or whatever the case is. I typically ask them how they normally do it. Um, and then however they do it, I kind of go with unless it's like they tell me like, we, well, we always all go in. All right, well, we're not, you know, really all going to go in if it's a COVID positive because that's just, you know, that there's no point of doing that. You know, like we don't need that many people inside of a structure. Um, 
so I, you know, but it ultimately just defaults on what they normally do, you know? So it's like, I try to go into these places and I try to be the person that changes for them versus them changing for me. You know, you have, you know, essentially you have a new quarterback on a football team. They're not bringing the plays from the other team and teaching everybody. They're learning the team's plays. And that's essentially how I, how I try to treat things. I try to be, try to create least amount of change as possible for them. So that way they're kind of operating as they normally do because that's how they do it. Like that's, they all work together. They know what works, what doesn't work. They figure that out. And I'm just there to kind of make sure that that goes as smooth as I can, allow, as I can make it while still making sure that we're safe at, you know, certain things. Certainly. Esco, would you say kind of the same thing? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, this pandemic has been a really big topic and it's, uh, it's a new item for us to tackle as an organization. I mean, I don't think we were, I don't think anyone can say they were prepared for us to respond to um, how we we're going to react as individually and as, as a group, right? So obviously folks have um, family at home that, you know, have comorbidity or whatever you want to say, and it's important for them versus some folks, they don't, you know, they might feel they're young and this isn't a big deal. But you have to, we have to gel as a family and tackle it together. And honestly, as an, you know, as a company, we should take notes for the next time, because although this might not have such a, uh, a big rate of morbidity, like mortality, I'm sorry, for us in the department, what happens next time when there is another type of pandemic? How, do, we, do we actually respond to this currently? So, I mean, I, I, I would say I think it's a good solid effort, and I think we could always do better, honestly, on it. And it's, and it's a, for me, it's a, it kind of is a little bit uh, for morale. It's a little depressing because obviously we're tackled or shackled by we can't train, we can't get out there because obviously we need to initially stay distant. It's getting better now, right? And, um, and I think the, the stressors have, you know, created some type of shift, but hopefully we can, as <coughs> lieutenants and masters and senior firemen, we can go back to focusing on our primary objective and it's delivering that service to the people at an affordable rate, right? So, um, but I mean, that's how I see it. And I think everyone's doing a good job. Being a year deep in this and going from firehouse to firehouse, do you, do you see some of that stress loosening up and, yeah. and let us, and I don't want to say shift our attitude towards uh, drilling or thing. Right. Do you see a, a shift with people, because, you know, a shift in the mentality inside of firehouses? Yes. Uh, and I look at that as people get used to you, you get used to certain personnel. One thing that we do well as an organization, um, is keep usually especially with the float lieutenant is keeping that float lieutenant in the same battalion so you get used to the uh personnel that you're working with it's a different shift every day but it's people that you're familiar with so you know how they're going to react to things they see how you may react to things so when it comes to things like um COVID, yeah you still bring that up at lineup you still bring up the importance of it and how we have to all take care of each other. But they, the, the shift knows, they're like, okay, this is something that Dre expects. You know, um, the same way um, I have expectations of that shift, they have expe expectations of me. And uh, it's just like working for a battalion chief, a battalion chief has expectations of me, I have expectations of that battalion chief. And then when it comes to drilling, it's pretty much the same way. Most shifts that I work on, they know that you know, after lineup, I'm going to want to do a drill. They also know that I'm going to want to do a drill in the afternoon. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go out and pull lines and throw ladders all the time. It could be a drill on a YouTube video that uh, of something, an event that occurred two or three in the street. years ago. Yeah, right, that's right. Challenges yeah. in the street. Exactly. That's yeah. a great plug. <laughs> and uh, right. Do you have a set of drills that that you keep? that you use from station to station, or do you kind of go on the fly with that? Yes, I do have a set of drills. You do? Yes, I do. Okay. And Joe, do you do, have the same, or? So I don't, I haven't really gotten into the weeds of like <laughs> doing big company drills yet, or even like station drills yet. I've, 
I'm still so new, especially doing all my time in the first, being assigned to the third, I'm still trying to learn areas and buildings and maps. So I typically, I'm still trying to get myself up to par. So I spend more of my time looking at maps of the area that I'm working at, trying to learn the battalion as a whole, since that's where I'm assigned. And, you know, trying to get shifts to take me out to learn buildings. And I try to learn that aspect of it more so than um, trying to do drills as of now. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, as time goes on and once COVID lessens up as much, we can get out to do more drills. But right now it's more so, I just try to learn more of the areas so that I'm better prepared for calls, trying to, I guess, drill myself more so than everyone else right and now. And that's indirectly helping the company. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Esco, same question to you, drills. Yeah. You know, so I've seen some, you videotape some stuff, and I, I, I like that. I think it's great. You I follow. Think that you're, you follow. I do. That's I do, cool. actually. Don't tell uh, anybody, but yeah, I do. That's all right. <laughs> so, so um, honestly, I when I first started um, as a lieutenant, I felt like I, I had the weight to create, be creative, and always have this new drill that no one's ever seen before. And honestly, um, you know, you could always start with the basics and doing the basics perfectly, right? So pulling a line, doing the ladder, and so on and so forth. But, you know, there, we have so much and resource for drills that you don't have to always create a new drill. So, you know, you have the ability to use any of the MBTs over and over. You can use these challenge industries, the boss talks. We can talk about an after action report. You know, we can try to simulate something off of that. Um, you have also, you know, running in, um, in tandem, you also have, everyone has driver's training. So you have engine drivers, truck drivers, squad drivers, right? How about the folks that are engine only house that have never seen a rescue squad? Let's talk about some rescue stuff. So, I, like again, initially I have I have created drills and we've participated and we've and I've leaned on um, senior folks and my masters. Hey, what do you what do you think is important? I mean, I know that you know today I'm at Company Twelve, and something on their on their um, you know on their plate is search. And I think that's very important, you know, primary and secondary, secondary search, and they're creating it, and they're going to execute it. Hopefully, I'm there to, to participate. Certainly. So I'm just a resource to make sure that they can get those things done, and, you know, that's, that's, that's the easiest part. It gets hard when you try to be super creative, right? And you yeah. don't have to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all three of you went from firefighter to lieutenant, yeah. correct? Yeah. So do you think... In, in the scheme of being a float officer, that that helped you or hindered you in your day-to-day -day job? <laughs> I think it helped me. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of discussion when you go different places and everyone has their own opinion of whether to skip master or not. Um, to me, I think it's beneficial to go from fire three and skipping that rank of master. Um, as long as you have the opportunity to to drive, right? So that's really the only aspect that you're missing out on a master is the driving aspect of it. But so us as fire threes before getting promoted lieutenant, we are right in the seat of ambulances, you know? So essentially we're doing half the job that we are as an officer in the, on an engine company. We're in the map books, we're talking on the radio, we're using the MDC, we're making decisions. Whereas a master, you're not doing all of those steps that you need as a lieutenant. Like their job is still very important and I don't want to take away value from that. but being a fire three you're doing more stuff you're looking at map books from different areas as a master you're basically setting your first due and knowing those streets but you're learning them and then you're driving them which is a different aspect of actually operating out of a map book so i think going from three to lieutenant is very valuable if you know because you're you're used to doing all of that you know so that i feel like that has helped me in my um transition from fire three to lieutenant i you know i was i would, I'd never got out of the map books running calls or making decisions on calls. Jerry, would you say the same thing? Yes, I believe that it's helped me a lot. And um, not doing that step? Right, skipping the step of master and going straight to lieutenant. I believe it's helped a lot, but one of the, the biggest help that came with me was my predecessors. So those who, you know, taught me or basically explained to me what was expected and, you know, the things that, but like, um, Lieutenant King was just saying, you know, being on an ambulance, looking in that map book all the time, it was basically so on Saturday, I was riding aid on the ambulance, and on Tuesday, I was riding E2 on paramedic engine 725, and I'm still looking in the map book. So 
there was uh, the stress level there was low. Um, and I know. What you... about the, some of the other stressors? So the interaction that I may have. So I have a regular driver. I'm assigned right. somewhere. I've had a regular driver for seven years now. Mm -hmm. So our interaction, um, you don't feel at any point that you missed out on, you know, I'm, I'm driving engine 702. Uh, I'm listening to the captain and his concerns right. or his thought process walking through this call. You don't think that puts you behind the eight ball? I honestly don't Good. think it has because, again, the officers that I had before me, you know, I'm going into a building with them, so I'm actually looking at the alarm systems. I'm looking at the decisions that they're making. So if we're running a high-rise box, and I'm like, and we're, they're saying that there's smoke on the fifth floor, I'm listening to the things that they are that they need or what they're looking for. You know, why do we have smoke on the fourth fourth floor? Is there, you know, something going on on the third floor before we get there? You know. Um, as a master firefighter, and again, not taking anything away from the master, but you're not hearing these things because you're out at the engine. You're actually, you know, getting water supply ready. You're making sure that we have water to fight that fire. So you're not actually hearing what that officer is saying, or you're not seeing that the, the decisions that that officer is making on the inside. Certainly. And I believe that's what helped me. So your training, your really preparation for lieutenant was you asking questions. Yes. Esco, would you say the same thing? Yeah, I, and I can agree with them too. Um, I think it also helps that I think all of us have been at certainly uh, stations with a special and an engine company. And But the things I, I, I kind of disagree because I've seen really good masters. And that's the thing, that's where the gray area with those, those two ranks, the Fire 3 and the Master. Sometimes we see, okay, a Fire 3 does the same thing as a Master. But when you, you come across a really good master, you, you, that person has set themselves <coughs> apart. They know how to, to, do, to move, maneuver the apparatus um, in a specific way, and they know how to get there in a specific way. And they're thinking about things, and they also will correct. And I'll, I've been corrected right. in, the, in the right way. You know, like, actually, you know, that's not a good access. And you don't, ever, you don't feel that that was taken away from you in no. any sense by no. not... The, operating in that position. The cat, I'm just like, I think, oh, you're saying that it. That you were never a master fireman. You no, know, I think if it would, I would appreciate being a master fireman because there's also precepting for a rookie. You know, there's, there's, there's all that other that we don't see as a master. I mean, there's a chance that you get exposed to station management. You know, mm -hmm. as a Fire 3, I'm coming in riding the ambulance. I don't care <clears> if a vendor or doesn't come in or not. Maybe the master does. I don't know, but that's what that's. I can see that those parts that you're so not. So arguments really both ways. Exactly. And how did you make that transition? Was it just asking a million questions and obviously studying and preparing yourself for the right. test? Um, what did you do? Anything else, or just ask a ton? Did they let you ride in charge? And I don't know where you were at, but yeah. wherever you were at, did you ride in charge in preparation to be? A lieutenant? So um, I was at 16. So fortunately enough, you know, I, I was able to flip between the two. They have volunteers that come in, uh, you know, to help out with staffing. So um, like I said, fortunately, I was able to be exposed to those two units and have the riding position to ride the front seat. So yes, that, but you, you know, it also takes outside of here. And I, and I think if you you plug in, and I'm sure these two these two dudes have plugged in um, outside of here into classes. And and I'll take uh, like Lieutenant Ballantyne told me a, a long time ago, put more feathers in your cap. You know, get yourself more, more exposure. I I took rope tech when I was at 25 because I wanted I don't want to stand there not knowing what to do. So that's you know that's what mm -hmm. I've done. Took that upon yourself. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So knowing those two things and you being in that position. Do you look at the person riding behind you and attempt to explain your actions? Even the, you know, and it might be somebody with only two or three years on the job, but one day they're going to aspire to be an, hopefully aspire to be an officer. So do you take the time to explain to people your thought process? Yeah, sure. And I yeah. think that's very important. And I try hard to do that. I don't know if I'm always successful at it. 
but I try to explain my thought process right uh, while I'm making decisions. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I ran the. I was working uh, in Battalion Three a few weeks ago. And we were running a five box, and even though we were placed in service as we were getting on scene, and we were the third dual engine, I asked my driver. I said, "Just you know, keep going. You know, don't go lights and sirens, but keep going." And I explained to the driver and the uh, folks right in the back why I chose the hydrant and what I was doing, what my plan was <clears throat> if this house was going to be on fire. And I explained to them, you know, the way I'm looking at this street and this hydrant, I already know that they're going to be units on top of each other. So now I have to think out the box and look at the how the you know how so you know if I with their do, I already know I want side Charlie access. And that's the access, you know, if we if it takes us going through, you know, a neighbor's backyard to get to the, the Charlie access. So you really turned house. it into a drill right. in itself. Yeah. And I believe that those are the things that's going to help the folks behind us because it's something that helped me, you know. Um, okay. Sometimes you have to think out the box. So we're going to pause for one second. Chief Davis, you, we have a couple of questions. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions to come in, one from a captain and one from a battalion chief. So uh, interesting perspective. So the captain asks, uh, curious if any of the three folks were involved in the mentorship program and if that influenced how they feel about whether or not being a master firefighter prior to being lieutenant affected their transition. Uh, and let me just read the next one because it's a little bit related. Uh, the other question is, uh, do you think that the master firefighter positions only really add a level of leadership skills versus uh, an operational aspect? So one, mentorship, and then I guess a uh, question about... Uh, so we'll go to Joe yeah. first. Uh, Joe, you participated <coughs> in the mentorship program. Um, kind of, if you, if you would, answer. So I personally think that the mentorship program is a really good program that we have started. Um, but like any program, we have areas that we should work on, um, things we should do differently. But I personally took a, a lot away from the mentorship. Um, I did a lot of seat time. It was about a year before when the list came out to when I started the mentorship program. And it was uh, for that year, I basically essentially ran the floor. So my captain was really big on getting me ready for the next step. He has the mentality that before I leave him, I should have as much knowledge of him that I can. So that might be where it comes in play where I feel like I feel okay skipping that master because I did a lot of the things. I was doing the station write-ups. I was doing um, the routing assignments. I was basically the station officer for essentially a year before I started the mentorship program. So that's where I feel like I'm at my mentality about skipping masters that way because I did so much already. So I feel like I haven't missed out on that. Um, but to be honest with you, to when I first heard about the mentorship program, I wasn't excited to do it. Um, I didn't feel like I was going to get a whole lot out of the program because I had so much going on at two and my captain really was making sure that I was ready for the next step. So I was kind of like, um, I had conflicting thoughts about how the mentorship program was. Um, I went into it with an open idea and I am really glad that that program is in place. One thing about riding the seat at two is, you know, before leaving there, I had five years there. So I knew the buildings, I knew the streets, I knew the maps, I knew the people, I knew the people that I was running with. So. That's because it's the greatest firehouse there is. <laughs> I would agree with you. So, <laughs> so, um, so you're really not using so towards the end of it, I wasn't really using my captain as a crutch so because I was comfortable in that area. But what was very valuable was going to a completely different area, a different battalion with a different officer, and having to learn the area, the people, the buildings, while knowing that I had that person behind me to be the crutch. So that was a lot more comforting than had I just got thrown there the first day from 2 to Station 3. That would have been a huge difference for me, but having an officer knowing that I was, you know, that was behind me, I felt a lot more comfortable with it. So I think it's a very good program. I think it's very valuable, and I'm glad that the county has started that program up, and hopefully it does some, hopefully there's a lot of changes, heard some changes here or there to make it a lot better. Yeah, certainly. 
Esco, I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, have you been to a firehouse with somebody that's being mentored? Yeah, uh, I have. And in the beginning, I felt it was inappropriate for me to mentor them because obviously I was still getting my feet underneath me, especially when I was out of battalion. So um, now I think I'd be comfortable enough to mentor somebody. And I think the mentorship program is, you know, worth its weight in gold because I've seen the packet and the packet is, addresses certain items that, you know, you, a uh, captain might not have come across. But because that packet has been fed in by multiple so re sources, then you get a, a good var variety of what might happen or what to consider. So I think the, ment the mentorship program is awesome. And, you know, I know it sucks for folks out there that have to ride A2, but when it's their time to step up or to take over, mm -hmm. they'll appreciate it. You can also apply that same mentality to, to getting a recruit, to doing driver's training, <laughs> exactly. to a, a myriad of, uh, of things. Eventually, exactly. it'll be your turn. It will, yeah. So, um, before the questions, Dre, you went to the COLA program. Yes. Um, and, and we do have a COLA program currently. They're going to do a Zoom program. Would you say kind of the same things about our company officer leadership academy that we had at one point? Right. I, I thought the COLA program, the only thing that I always said it was too short. Uh, I wish that there was more time, but like anything, you know, you can't, you have to get what you can get out of it um, and jam whatever you could get in it. But there were a lot of good things that came out of that program, especially uh, some of the um, presenters that you had speaking about leadership and accountability. And uh, it's something that I took away from that program. So yeah, I good. believe it helped out a lot. Good. Chief Davis? Yes, so we have two more questions. They are not related. So let me ask you the first, and then the second you can after you answer. So the first one uh, asks, how long did it take each of the lieutenants to feel comfortable operationally? Joe, are you comfortable yet? I go in waves. <clears throat> um, I've only been uh, promoted since uh, late July, early August. So I think my comfortable level depends on where I am. Um, if it's the first time that I am at a firehouse, I'm a little uncomfortable because um, I don't know anybody. I don't know the area. I don't know the map books. So that part of operations, I'm a little uncomfortable. But if I go back to somewhere where I've spent a lot of time, I'm a lot more comfortable. Um, same thing with um, the people that I'm working with. If I've worked with them before and I know how they operate, then that, that adds to the comfort bolt level. And a lot of it, too, is, you know, the master, you know, depending on how the master is, how it's, you know, you can read how the master is. If being a backstep guy, you're comfortable being behind an officer. As an officer, you're comfortable with the master, a good master next to you. And I think that, you know, that just depends, the comfortable level depends on where I'm at and who I'm riding with, honestly, mm -hmm. operationally wise. But as far as like running the calls, like I'm, I'm comfortable knowing what to do, when to do it, where to go, like that kind of thing. But as far as like how we actually operate, you know, I'm still learning. Great. After two and a half years, are you comfortable? Uh, I'll sit here for the most part. I feel that I am, but I don't ever want to say that I'm too comfortable because to me, if you have, if you feel like you're too comfortable, you get complacent. Complacent. And that's something that, I, that's just a area that I don't want to be in. So, you know, there are times I still, you know, have that in the back of my mind. Well, what if this happens? What is that? What if that happens? And that could be running a simple call. That could be a per dealing with a personnel issue. That could be dealing with a station maintenance issue. You know, I, I just can't sit here and actually say that I am comfortable because, again, um, when complacency sets in, that you're, you find yourself in a bad area. Chief, the next question. Thank you. Uh, so this one's a little long, but it's all tied together. <laughs> Do any of you do any of you talk with the crews of the units you are riding with to find out if there's predetermined roles already, like who lays out, how do you pull a long line, extend a line, how are ladders deployed, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera? That's Say, cool. and if you do, hold on. Oh, just came in, hot off the wire. Boom. <laughs> and if you do. 
Do you go with what they say, or do you change it? So uh, they, I 100% talk to my crew um, to know that they have, we have some type of expectation and some type of game plan. So um, I think generally in the county, we've all um, collectively have gone to like a, a long line, more so than leader line, especially with the addition of the 300. So that's an example. But, you know, we'll still have the discussion about leader lines as well. Um, but you definitely want to gauge the folks that you are working with and their experience prior to the call. Because there's chances that we will run into an event where a Fire 2 is riding a rescue squad or a Fire 2 is riding uh, a truck company. And those are events that we are understaffed, obviously. And, and basically, those are events that could be high risk. And you don't want to just say, hey, you, at least get their name, right? Hey, Johnny, hey, Jane. That's a good start. Right? We can start off with your name at least. Yeah. And then we, we can figure out what your skill level is. And, and then that go, just runs right into the drill part. So for me, for instance, um, I always have conversations with the folks, even with folks that I've run with before. And, and that helps me with the IRP. An example would be like, let's say we're going on a, a, a structure fire. Hey, guys, it, in the MDC, it looks like it, and the map book, it looks like it's a single fam. Um, I'm talking to my driver, you've got it, make sure you leave room for the truck, right? Hey, I think that we can get it with an inch, uh, inch and a half. I'm going to go run my 360. The game plan is this. If, I don't, if you don't hear from me or you don't see me and I tell you something else, I expect you to be there. So then when I'm doing my 360, I already know which line they're pulling, the length. I'm going with this crew. I don't have to verify on the scene. So. I think um, talking to your crew at all times and giving your expectations in the morning like Dre does kind of eliminates the mistakes later. Certainly, the communication yes. component. Communication yeah. is key. We've talked about that through almost every one of these programs has, has linked that communication together. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so let's think about the process of you getting promoted from us uh, announcing the material to you studying to the test, um, how helpful was the department with that process? Up until my mentorship program, I would say that all of that is put on the fellas at two, being um, my captain who's prepared me um, and everyone below who was, you know, took a hit on the ambulance so I can ride extra an extra day in front of the captain so a lot of that was was my shift um and even you know firehouses around me like they knew that i was new as in the seat um so they were you know watchful for that um but up until the mentorship program i feel like the county didn't provide a whole lot of help in that area there's really no um kind of training or classes to help you become an officer until you're on the list and that's, I mean, strategy and tactics, you know, but you get that so early on in your career, you basically, you get that now, I, I think you get that in the academy now. You know, I had eight years before I was on the list, so all that stuff is kind of, you know, not fresh in my brain. So outside of the mentorship program, I would say it all pretty much just goes to my firehouse and my shift. So I heard you say yes. What, yeah. what would you change about that? There, there's nothing I would change about it. I agree with him that most of the help that I received all came from my shift at 23. And that came from both officers, you know, challenging me. I'm riding in front of the front of the uh, wagon, and we could just be going to the grocery store. And it's, hey, Dre, this is going on right now. This is your resources. By the way, paramedic engine 703 just crashed, and paramedic engine 721 you see on the MDC is on an EMS call, so you know you have a your engine coming from 20. What decisions are you making? Oh, by the way, you don't have your tower. It th That came from those uh, guys and girls at 23 that helped me out. And then also dealing with personnel issues. You know, I was walking in the morning and they're like, well, you know what? Firefighter A has a problem here with, you know, firefighter B or, you know, how would you solve it? Oh, and by the way, you can't call a battalion chief because they're at an incident right now. So what will you do to, you know, Solve it, resolve this issue. And Esco, was your experience kind of the same? Yeah, I would say um, I did receive help from the 
fellows at Company 16. Um, but it's the COLA class was still around when I went through. And what I appreciated from that was there was a blurb, I think it was either uh, Chief Davis or Chief Fitch, where they had the uh, non-SOP driven calls. You know, we can sit here all day and say first do, second do, third do, fourth do, and fifth do. But then what if you go to these other calls that we didn't have the IRP? I mean, the IRP is great, um, it's, and it's obviously improving every day, but we're starting to address these calls. But, you know, I had to really dive in, okay, what's our uh, bread and butter, like 90% of our call load, we're, I mean, is these routine emergencies. You know, your Pepco, your Washington Gas, I mean, they had the, the uh, uh, oil leak inside the home in the basement. Who are we calling for that, you know? And yeah. stuff like that. So those are things that, hey, uh, you know, I wish we had a little bit more resources for it. It is available. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, you know, in creating yourself to become a better officer, you should be looking for these other questions to be answered. Do you think going from place to place, and any one of you can answer this, do you believe the IRP is as understood from field personnel as management would want it understood or that you understand it? I feel like and anybody. I feel like what you're doing on a call position wise is really well known. You know, first do has this, second do has this, third do has this, and that is pretty much standard across the board. But when you get in the the weeds of the IRP, like the actual like specific testable material, if you will, that's not so well known because it's not um, every day that we run those types of calls. I guess in different appendixes of the IRPs, right? So like the firefighter policy, yes, we know that. Like a structure fire, we know that. We know high rises, um, but you know, like at two, we weren't so up to par with the rural assignment, you know, appendix C that you would be at 13 and they're not as well at the high rise that we are at two or at one. So that's where you come into, at least what I see of differences of knowledge of the IRP. It's people are knowing what, it, what they're responsible for in their area for lack of a better term. Do you talk about that going on calls? You're the second engine on a whatever. Right. Do you talk about, hey, we're second, this is what we're going to do? Right. So if I'm getting my uh, layout instructions from the first door officer, I want to make sure that my driver understood where that hydrant is, you know, um, if we're going to do a, if we're, you know, we're going to pick up that hydrant or if we're doing some type of maybe a reverse lay or if we're picking up a split, you know, that's something that is very important. And again, it goes back to the communication. You have to communicate with not only that driver, but that crew. So I guess what I'm asking, do you find yourself explaining the IRP uh, more or? No, no, not at all. No. They, uh, most crews that I work with, they already have an idea of what they need to do. And uh, that's something that's great about the IRP that is, you know, everything is spelled out for you. Now, and. There are those times, again, that Lieutenant Escalero mentioned that, you know, you're going to hit one of those areas that it's not written for you and you have to sort of think out the box and it's not SOP driven. Okay. Um, and, and kind of probably we're going to start to wind it down. So one of the last questions I want to, I want to ask, um, do you ever feel lost as a float lieutenant? And if you do, uh, how do you cope with that? What do you do to deal with that? Oh. And Joe, I don't know if... if... <laughs> Joe, you're the most lost here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there are times that I feel lost um, around the firehouse just in general in the day, um, but I kind of use my resources, and the resources are a wide range of resources. That could be the master of the firehouse. That could be the rookie of the firehouse. You know, the rookie of the firehouse knows probably where most of the inventory is the fire because they're the ones gathering everything. So it's more like using my resources. Um, and I feel like I have a wide range of other officers or people that I know that I can bounce ideas off of. Um, so if I find myself lost in a situation, I just, you know, I kind of phone a friend and kind of talk through it and figure out my decision process of how, you know, what one person will do. And I'll typically do it with like two different people and get two different asp ideas of it and then figure out what I think would be best with a mash of three ideas and kind of just kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. That's a good question to you. Do you, after four years, it's four all years? my tutelage. All my, yeah. yeah. Um, do you feel lost? 
So I, I'm going to... Or could you get lost it's easily? It's the same exact thing he says. Is basically, depending if I haven't had exposure to or haven't been there, um, yes. And it's more, more so, not operationally, it could be station-wise. Like, hey, we're doing the... Uh, the, what was the recent thing for snow? Um, you have to fill out for the generator. I forget what we call it, but anyways. Station a, survey. Station survey, yeah. You know, I don't know where your stuff's at. Let me, help me out here. Mm -hmm. But um, it does, it's helpful to phone a friend. I mean, you know, obviously I have his number, I have your number, uh, Dre's number, and, and all the lieutenants that I go, hey, what do you do? What do you have? Um, it is one um, a lieutenant shared with me, but like uh, Bob Foss has, I call it the Foss Files. And it's my go-to for all station forms, and you know any type of uh, you know verbal reprimand. Should you, should you say that you ha if you had we had to go there, I have it there. You know I can follow this form or in first report of injury. So I think in those cases, uh, if you're lost, it, like he's saying, plug into what you have or call somebody. It doesn't have to be immediately addressed. Drain, I'm going to ask you the very final question. Uh, have you encountered any issues? Then they could be an apparatus issue, it could be a personnel issue, it could be a facility issue, where it has challenged everything you have and everything you've learned to solve the problem. Um, not, of, not, a, not as of late. Uh, the one issue that I can think of is uh, I was working at Station 12, I was detailed there, and uh, it's funny, Chief Davis was actually the battalion chief, and uh, I had a driver, and we're going down Powder Mill Road, and I'm actually, you know, looking in the map book and trying to get this building and listening to PG communications of what we're doing, and I see cars ahead of us, and I'm like, okay, you want to slow down, uh, let these cars get out the way, and he looks over and he goes, I'm not doing anything, and I'm like, and I look out the window and I can actually see this truck sliding, and for the most part, it, it seemed like every car get, got out the way except for one car, and he was able to maneuver to where there was minimal damage to the vehicle, and there was really no damage to the truck at all, and uh, he, the driver did a great job, but then I knew, okay, now I know I have to make that call to the battalion chief, I have to make that call to the safety officer, and my entire my thinking in my mind is you know i have to be an advocate for this driver now because i know that he personally did everything that he can to avoid that accident and i had to explain that in my statement to the battalion chief and the safety officer and you know it was a good turnout for that driver that that driver wasn't at it after you know the statements went up but that's probably the last one I could really think of. Okay, thank you. Chief, you said you have two, two final questions. I do. So, uh, just, uh, so for folks watching, we may run a few minutes over. It's no big deal. Uh, we got some questions coming in, and uh, we want to get them taken care of. So uh, first one, I'll, I'll read you the first one. You can handle it, and then I'll read you the second one because they're not related. Uh, first one says, does the panel feel that anything they learned in classes required for promotion, such as Fire Officer 1, Instructor 1, and so forth, provided them any useful training for the promotion versus the leadership program, mentorship, on-the-job training, I guess, that we do as a department. Joe, you're the last guy. Uh, to be honest, I don't. So I took Fire Officer 1 long time ago just checked the box when i came out of the academy so i feel like that information is not relevant to preparing myself for the next step um, so what i basically value that on is the cola program and the mentorship program um, that takes that was a big help to me and i think part of it too it depends upon like where you take the class so we could take any class in mifbri anywhere in the state and your topics are going to vary like i'm currently taking fire officer to now at this PSTA with all county guys, and that is geared towards Montgomery County operations, and that is more beneficial than if I were taking Fire Officer 2 in Carroll County. Um, so I think it, de it depends upon where you take the class. I think some of the classes that we have to take for promotion are like kind of pointless, you know, to be honest with you. Like we have to take an IPPA class before you can sit for the lieutenant's test. I took that class, who knows when, um, who knows when I'm gonna ever write an IPPA. You know, I could get all the way to the rank of captain before I have my firehouse, and then I'm writing the IPPA. So why, you know, 
we have to take that class, but it really doesn't present any information for us to be an officer. Um, I think, honestly, more of the value should be placed on the SCOLA program and this mentorship program than what classes, fire officer classes that we have to take for the promotion. Thank you. Chair, question two, Chief. And then there'll be a question three. Okay. <laughs> so if you feel the need to use the restroom, just hang in there. All right. Uh, Oh, well, there was a question for us, sorry. What? Anyway, so uh, do you find that you are assigned to ride the engine company often when floated to an unfamiliar area? This would be for a double house, right? And, in, and the officer assigned there is riding the special. In other words, you get put on the engine, the regular officer, or the other officer goes on the special, and uh, do you find that it places you at a disadvantage or not? Trey, you look like you want to answer that. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I actually accept the challenge. I accept the challenge of it, and uh, I love it. So if I go into a house and, you know, that regular officer says, hey, I'm riding the truck, the tower, the squad, and you're riding the seat of the engine, well, that's what I've practiced for. That's what I came here for. That, so, you know, I know that, you know, if there is an event, I'm making that decision, yeah. and um, I'm ready for it. I'm ready I for like the that challenge. Answer. That's a good answer. I'm the same way. And that's, even even with the mentorship program, that is geared towards an engine officer. Like you, we prepare our officers to be engine officers, not so much the special service. Every, there's an engine at every firehouse, except for what two. But so you would just have you have more experience on engine companies in general. Where I'm like Dre, I, I'd prefer to go in and ride the engine, and you know, I don't feel uncomfortable that way. Good. Question three of four. So do you ever reach out to the regular assigned officer prior to you being detailed to a station to get a gauge on the players and situations that you may be facing? To be honest, no. Um, I've never had to do that. I've only engaged the officer if there was an, something that came up or an issue um, to keep them in the loop. But... Uh, most of the officers I've seen, you know, they have a well-oiled well machine that generally they don't have to be there or give me their two cents. Like a master will take over, senior fireman will take over. And then, uh, you know, really, no, don't really have to call them. Question four of five. <laughs> <laughs> Do you struggle more with the administrative side or operational side of your job? Right. Uh, to answer that question, I think it's even, uh, you know, like I said uh, earlier, you know, the organization does a great job of preparing us for operational things. And if there is something that is administrative, um, like Lieutenant King mentioned earlier, you know, you can always phone a friend. And that's something that helps. You know, I know I could pick up the phone and call the captain, you know, down the street, or if I have to, you know, call a battalion chief and say, hey, this is what I have going on. Can you help me out here? And for the most part, people, they want to help, you know, this, you know, why we're all here. We all yeah. want to help each other out. And at the end of the day, it's all about making the organization look good, you know. Question five of five. <laughs> and it's my question, actually, I thought about this. So have any of you uh, served in a long-term assignment as they float? In other words, you got parked somewhere uh, to replace somebody, and what was that like? Uh, I was parked at uh, both Station 25 and Station 15. And uh, 25 was awesome to be parked at because uh, we call it you get your sets and reps, right? You know, we all know what 25 is and what type of call loads they go to, but, um, you know, I got my sets and reps. I got really comfortable there. Uh, and it's great to be part of a shift, obviously. Everyone wants to be a part of a shift because you create the camaraderie. You have some type of, uh, some type of uh, plan to execute and get folks to, to develop themselves. And you, you want to, if you ever get parked, you want to take the advantage of that to kind of reflect and you know, gain some knowledge from the captain. Both stations had a captain, so that was a plus. I have not been parked at a place where it'd be myself only. Um, but I would say just, you know, you're handing the football, don't fumble the football, just take care of it so when the lieutenant comes back, 
it, you know, they keep on moving. Did it help you fine tune the way? Uh, how I operate? How you operate. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and I think, you know, you know, people have ideas like they should kick out, and I'm sorry, senior lieutenants, they should kick out the senior lieutenants to float. Junior lieutenants like us hang in. And I can see why. I understand that perspective. But it was nice to be parked in two, in two different houses. Yeah, you begin to see people develop and things yeah, like that, exactly. which is the nice part. We go real quick. One more? All right. It's actually a statement, right? So, uh, and this would be for all company officers and actually everybody who's watching, right? So, in those incidents that aren't driven by our SOP or IRP, you do have the operational doctrine to fall back on, right? That's been, I guess, uh, I'll say a philosophy statement of what the department expects. And that starts from the top down. So the top leaders would say in these non-SOP driven and the choices and the decisions that you've made, how are they addressed in the operational doctrine, right? And that would, that would be everybody's starting point. And there will still be some things that may not hit there, but that's, that's going to be that point. So there are no more questions. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in and um, joining me today, joining us today, talking a little bit about your experiences as a float lieutenant, how you got there, what worked, what didn't work. Um, our next challenge in the street actually is on uh, March 24th. We will be live from Fire Station 18 uh, with Captain Dement and Lieutenant Henry, and the title will be Being a CPR Boss. Uh, so we will talk about that process. So if you want to stand by, uh, we have, in closing, we have a, a little bit of video from Days Gone from old MCFRS Today uh, that is fun to watch. Thank you, and until next time.
Ice, 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 ice.